I'm Eleanor Spies Ferris. I'm a visual artist. But I decided I would like to write. And so the story that I'm going to read was written in uh, 2014. It has a copyright. And the title of it is called The Art Store. And I will start. And you'll have to forgive me if I make flubs. <laughs> But okay, here we are, the art store. The dirt path down the hill was uneven. And in some places, the rocks, round and gray, made foot travel difficult. Small pedals, pebbles seemed to gather around the large rocks and would always find their way into her sandals as she tried to avoid the big stones and thus a fall. When she was young, she would have bounded over the rocks and never worried about tumbling. But now, as her cane steadied her, she knew that she could ill afford the fall that could come easily with a misstep where once she could have taken the walk to the art store in 10 minutes, she now planned on a good 45 minutes there and back with a tea at El Corrado that helped her to regain her strength. Perhaps today she would stop for their famous lamb stew. She dismissed the idea quickly as she remembered that she had only enough money for the pastel stick and a tea. The path emptied onto a narrow sidewalk and the remainder of the walk was relatively easy for most, but for her, it was painful. With her very, every step, the pain would remind her that she was not the redheaded youth she had been when first she moved to this remote village. It had been summer when she first arrived and bought the little casa at the top of the hill overlooking the town. Then artists from all over the world had come to paint and to take in the hot springs just a few miles away. Now the mystique was gone and only a few would-be painters would arrive on the train out of Chicago. Most would not stay the summer, and a few would actually paint the varied mysterious landscapes that surrounded this mountainous town. They, the newborn artists, usually rolled out of their beds around three in the afternoon, had a cup of coffee, and then meandered to the bars near the plaza. There they would talk about art and drink until dawn and stagger back to the three-story adobe hotel on the north end of the plaza. She never went to the saloons, but always enjoyed her own bourbon in the shadow of her own porch, where she reminisced silently about creative friends that no longer came during the hotter months in the East and Midwest. She never regretted coming to the town. She always found pleasure painting the ravines and the plateaus of the area. She never tired of the landscape. In past years, she would drive for miles in the old black hearse she had purchased, used in Raton, searching for unusual settings. It was the perfect car for her with plenty of space for canvases and art materials in the back. No one ever bothered her. She figured that it was due to the hearse. Everyone feared that car. Then the car, like herself, had stopped, simply stopped running. It was on the day they had diagnosed her pain. Between the doctors and the mechanics, it was made plain to her. She could no longer go out into the countryside and paint. Her life would never be the same. And as time progressed, 
so would the illness. She would find it harder and harder to make her paintings. On the rare occasions when it rained, she stayed home. But most days, she forced herself to walk to the little art store. The door would hit the hanging bell as she entered the small store. Mr. Aragon would greet her as he had done for nearly 50 years with a half smile and a flirtatious wink. She still saw him as a curly haired, handsome man in his white shirts and blue jeans, not as the balding man with the extended belly that stood before her. She wondered if he saw her as she had been and not this decrepit woman. She had always fancied him. Nothing had come of their innocent flirtations, mainly because of his raven-haired wife and his five children. She regretted that and wondered if he did too. She never would ask him, although she was tempted. Carefully, she had stroked each tube of oil paint, turning them over as to read the ingredients that she knew all too well. He would stand, barely touching next to her with his white starch shirt brushing up against her freckled arm. He would speak to her of the latest art supplies. His voice would always be soft and quiet, and his breath would leave her skin tingling. With a new tube of zinc white or ultramarine blue, she would rush home to the solitary safety of her bedroom and imagine his arms around her and his continued whispers. Did he do the same when the sky was dark and the moon shone over the mountains? Today, tired from the walk, she leaned against the door jamb and caught her breath. For safekeeping, she stored her cane in a tall ceramic jar. She moved to a wooden cabinet with many narrow drawers. She opened the first one. There lay sticks of blue to green pastels, lined up in their individual crepes, like the unborn waiting for the artist to bring them to life. She opened the next drawer and petted the warm colors. The third drawer yielded umbers, ochres, and the various shades of black and gray. As always, she gasped at each selection, the colors tempting, rich, and seductive. She no longer studied the oil paints or the brush bristle brushes. For if she had desired to paint, her hands would have rebelled and not allowed her to squeeze the tubes or hold the brushes for very long. But the pastels were another story. They gave forth such lovely colors wrapped in their transparent sheaths and could be simply admired. For several months, she had come to buy just one pastel at a time. She had spent at least an hour just deciding which color she would take home with her. He would come to her side, and together they would address each stick and its colors in whispers. They would speak of the green pignon trees and the blue-gray of the mountains. Together they would remember when the sky was filled with pink and yellow and the earth would turn dark brown after a rain. She realized that they both had lived their lives in the color of the land around them and it made her feel closer to him. But today, he did not come to the pastel cabinet. He did not step from behind the counter. After his initial smile, his face fell into sadness. Lovely lady, he said, 
I will be closing the store in three days. She clutched the cameo pin at her throat so tightly that the pin pricked the palm of her hand and her breath seemed to stop. Why? she asked. So many reasons, but mostly he paused in mid-speech and shook his head. I will go to Albuquerque to be with my youngest son. He has an extra room. All have gone now, and I am alone and sick and so very tired. Her shoulders folded more into themselves, and the pains in her arms screamed even more loudly. She moved to him and reached out and held his hand for the first time in 50 years. Why had she not taken the courage to hold his hand before? Why had she not done this when his wife had died or when his sons had moved away? Why had she only dreamed of his arms and not been more forceful with her desires? He carefully squeezed her hand in return and his eyes told her that he too had the very same thoughts. What color today, he said in a whisper. Help me choose. What color would you suggest? Still holding her hand, he moved from behind the small counter and together they walked back toward the open pastel drawers. Here, he said, as he reached for a color that was pushed to one side in the drawer. He kept hold of her with one hand and gave the pastel to her with the other. It is color that is not seen here. It is my favorite beca color because of that very reason. I had always hoped I would see it in the real, but his head drooped and she could barely hear him when he spoke again. Please take it as a gift. She did not stop for tea, but walked slowly home. Tears filled her eyes and her nose ran. She brushed away all of them with the sleeve of her shirt. In her studio, she looked at the long shelf hanging on the west wall where she had swirled the pastels away. Beside each pastel was a small folded card on which she had painstakingly written the date of her purchase, and a brief description of how she would have used the color if indeed she had used it. The handwriting was erratic and barely legible. legible. The yellow wolf ochre would have worked in the foreground of a fall landscape. The Prussian blue seemed to speak to deep mountain shadows. The reds would have blended well into a brilliant sunset over the ruins of the adobe church just outside of town. Now she held the gift pastel in her hand and looked at the long line of other colors. It did not belong anywhere. She tried it beside the sky blues and then the earth greens. It was foreign to all of this arid dry color wheel. On her studio desk was a medium-sized handmade tin box with a lid. After opening, she placed the unusual pastel in it. She wrote the day's date on the folded card. Then she wrote in capital letters only one word to describe where she would have used this strange color, sea foam. And she added a question mark. The next three days were filled with rain, unusual for this time of year on the high plateau. The path turned slippery with mud. She did not go back to the art store. She wondered if it really was the rain, the pain, or the simple fact that she could just not bear the regrets. On the evening of the third day, a station wagon pulled into her driveway and parked next to the hearse. Before she could walk around from the studio window to the front door, it was gone. Carefully, 
She opened the door and peeked out. There, under the shelter of her porch, was a cabinet with small drawers. Some raindrops had beaded up on the newly polished surface. Suddenly, the sky turned dark and the black clouds burst open. Rivulets of rain ran down the driveway gravel. The water turned right onto the dirt path, washing it away. On sunny days, she could always see the rooftops zigzagging across the plateau from the large west window of her studio. But today, she could barely make out the mountains looming in the distance between swirling raindrops and the window light blinking on and off in the dark mist below. She felt a handful of pastels in her smock, rescued from the cabinet and the rain. She placed them on the table with the thought of arranging them as she had arranged the others. Suddenly, inspired, she turned toward the window and the dark landscape. She seated herself painfully before it with the memory of all the colors swirling, swirling around in her head, she began to imagine. She decided that the sky was a mixture of blue, gray, ivory black with a touch of burnt sienna. Her tears fell on her gnarled, folded hands like the rain that splashed against her window. Her mind smudged and pushed the colors she introduced a deep purple, but then mentally brushed it away for a viridian green mixed with cobalt blue. Her colors changed as the storm expanded and receded until the rain stopped and the landscape was calm. As the rain clouds disappeared, she could see the crimson and gold of the setting sun. Just above the sunset, was a slash of an unusual blue. Ah, she said to herself, perfect. Thank you, Mr. Aragon. And that's the end. <laughs>